I call the meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee to order and note for the record that a quorum is present. And we have a bill author here, we have quorum, we are ready to rock. And so with that, we do have a set of, we have two, two minute uh, approval of minutes that we need from previous hearings. So Vice Chair Edelson, would you move approval of the minutes from Monday, February 27th? Uh, so moved, Madam Chair. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The motion pre prevails and the minutes are adopted. The second set of minutes we have are from Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. Vice Chair Edelson, would you like to make a motion to approve those minutes? That's my motion. Madam Chair. Oh, yes. Thank Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Unfortunately, I have noticed a mistake in the minutes. Oh, great. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. What is, can you note the mistake, please, Representative Heinzman? We could talk offline if you'd like. Oh, okay. So we will not do approval of the minutes today, and we can have a conversation after committee. So, um, so we'll hold on the March 1st, uh, 2023 minutes. Great. So that is, so we have one bill on the calendar for today, which is House File... 1440 and representative Howard you are a member of the committee so would you like to move that house file 1440 be re-referred to the general register yes chair Olson, so moved thank you for your motion and you have an author's amendment the a8 amendment would you like to move that and adopt it and then describe your bill yes chair I would move to adopt the a8 amendment okay and maybe we I will have you just quickly if you could walk through the change you're making in the a8 amendment Th thank you, Chair. The The main substantive changes were reducing spending um, in the A from $100 million to $50 million, narrowing the scope of the bill to resources that uh, we can target on a more urgent basis. Great. Any discussion to the A8 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The motion prevails and the A8 amendment is adopted. So to your bill as amended, Representative Howard. Thank you, Chair Olson and members of the committee. Uh, members, last Thursday on the House floor, we passed uh, the Pathway Home Act, uh, a bill with critical resources uh, to support Minnesotans who are experiencing homelessness. And what this bill will do will help prevent Minnesotans from becoming homeless, uh, and it's urgently needed. Uh, throughout much of the pandemic, federal resources were utilized so that Minnesotans could stay home and stay safe. And it worked. We helped Minnesotans stabilize in their homes, landlords were made whole, and we kept our state moving forward. In the beginning of 2022, those federal resources dried up, uh, but the needs facing Minnesotans did not. And we've seen significant consequences for our community all across the state since. And I just want to uh, highlight a few data points that, that underscore, I think, what uh, we all know is happening quite well. Uh, in 2022, Greater Twin Cities United Way's 211 resource helpline received more than 400,000 calls from Minnesotans. And the top reason people reached out to 211 was uh, concerns for housing, shelter, and utility assistance, which represented 64% of all of their requests. Last year, there were more than 20,000 evictions in Minnesota, a huge spike that uh, places evictions up uh, surpassing pre-pandemic levels. In several counties, family homelessness up is skyrocketing. In Hennepin County alone, there was a 278% increase in family homelessness last year. Uh, members, we have a multi-layered long-term uh, uh, challenge with our uh, uh, housing crisis that requires that we uh, pursue both immediate and long-term solutions. And this bill represents the crisis that folks are facing right right now and will help us keep folks stable in their home uh, and ensure that they have the emergency rental assistance if someone you know loses a job and, and falls behind uh, someone that is paying more than 60 percent of their income and in rent uh, if you if you miss a paycheck you're going to be in dire straits and this bill responds to that concern it does so through an investment in the family homelessness prevention assistance program or fhpap which is a well-established program serving Minnesotans in all 87 counties across uh, the state. Local experts uh, are able to coordinate with Minnesotans experiencing, experiencing housing instability and help with emergency rental assistance and other housing essentials when folks are facing a crisis. 
It's a program that has worked well, preventing housing displacement and evictions, uh, getting us upstream, upstream to help families before uh, they face homelessness and all of the collateral consequences that come with it. As I mentioned, this bill will provide $50 million uh, dollars, uh, an influx in funding for FHPAP that will flow uh, to existing FHPAP grantees. In doing so, we can get resources out the door quickly because the need is significant uh, and, and right now. Uh, when this bill was before the Housing Committee, we heard from FHPAP administrators in both suburban and greater Minnesota communities. One shared that they traditionally release FHPAP dollars quarterly and that the need is so great that by the end of the first week, all of their funds are expended. Uh, so that gets at the urgent need and how scarce the resources are currently. With a $17 billion surplus, there's no reason to wait. With urgency, uh, we have a chance to prevent homelessness for Minnesotans all across the state, and I would encourage your support. Thank you, Representative Howard. Discussion to the bill. Representative Nash. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the author who's hiding behind the chair. Uh, I appreciate that you've amended in the reporting p uh, piece that we'd ask for. Uh, I think that when we make grants of this size that adding some of that reporting is, is important, uh, particularly since I think in our committee we've beaten that drum maybe, you know, a couple times more than you'd like. Um, but so as to the 50 million, I, I certainly understand that, that this is um, a priority for you all and that there are people who find themselves in in situations but uh, I, I do know that there there used to be a limit on the number of months that could be um, provided can you tell us what that was and what it's changed to in your bill representative Howard Charlson um, representative Nash so uh, I believe with FHPAP uh, you can receive up to 24 months of assistance and that is different than the emergency rental assistance uh, that was utilized through federal dollars, which I believe had an 18 month cap. Um, and so uh, it does speak to some of the interaction with those pieces. Folks that, it, for example, if you had been sort of timed out, you had used all of that allotment of federal resources, you may be able to access FHPAP resources. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I certainly understand, and we've talked about this in, in committee, so I won't hog a lot of the time here, but I, I just think that. Um, I would like to find a way to um, to shorten the length and help people learn to get off of this. I mean, I I think we share that goal is to get people to, to be able to stand on their own. Um, and then I'll just make the comment that that once again, I, I you and I see housing sometimes in a little different uh, light. Uh, I think we both recognize the absolute impact that housing and stability make in people's lives, and and I am supportive of many of the issues that that are behind this. But I I, I just couldn't couldn't let this 50 million go by without talking about the fact that we're you know we are in need of building more here in the state of Minnesota, building more, uh, and this doesn't actually build any new homes. Um, we are the absolute worst in the country as from an inventory perspective. Uh, and it's ironic that we have this bill in Ways and Means today because it's housing day here on, on the Hill. We need to build more houses. And um, I, to the best of my recollection, we have not talked really about building much in our committee. And I, I think that that's regrettable. Um, you know, so I, I'll be voting no. I encourage uh, members on my, my side to vote no. I think that there are some, some worthy efforts in here, but I just think that the overall uh, span of the spend is, is pretty high, particularly when we're looking at uh, a housing inventory crisis that's gone yet unaddressed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to the author, uh, Chair Howard. So I'm glad to, uh, to hear you say earlier that you think you're gonna get this in your target. Uh, in regards to that, because we haven't really seen those targets yet, and this would be quite a, even this would be quite an increase from previous uh, targets. So uh, appreciate that. My question uh, really revolves around um, kind of what Representative Nash, Nash talked about too, and that is the timing. Earlier in your presentation, you talked about last year being a record number of evictions. Uh, but I think if we keep that in perspective, the previous two years was probably a record low number of evictions and so that was just catching up from what the government kind of mandated and kind of put people into and so it's it's a situation where 
people, and I've talked to quite a few landlords, uh, one just on Saturday who said he had an individual that didn't pay for three years uh, and then was evicted, and then he was going to be sued um, by it until he, the landowner talked to the uh, uh, attorney and said, well, he could apply for the back rent. Well, finally they did, and he got most of it back. But I asked him, I said, so what did this individual do with the money that he would have paid for rent because he didn't pay it? And they said, well, they bought new furniture and a bigger TV, et cetera. I mean, that's the decision that they have to make. But the point is, is that sometimes we have to be careful not to enable poorer decisions. So I, I'm concerned that we have extended this maybe a little longer, uh, but the report will help for us to find out where it is. And so my question to you is, do you have any concerns about um, the extending of that beyond 24 months and, uh, and what that might entail? Representative Howard. Uh, Chair Olson, Representative Petersburg, um, a, a few comments. Um, specifically, well, well to, to your last question about the time period, right now, you know, the, the FHP, AP dollars are so limited and the need is so significant. That I don't have the data right in front of me, but um, the, the dollars are not traditionally being spent at that large of a time span. They're, they're being used in a more targeted way to, you know, help somebody pay a utility bill so they literally don't get evicted. That, you know, they're, they're for more prescient, prescient um, critical needs. I do think having this level of resource might provide a little greater flexibility to help somebody stabilize um, it, so that they can sort of move forward. And I think that's a, a goal we should share to, for folks to stabilize and have that ability uh, to move forward. Um, and and so that, that speaks to the timelines. I'm sorry, could you repeat, did I miss another no. question there? Is that, does that cover it? That was, okay. uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, that was really the concern because it, it really does go outside the norm of what we normally do. And I just have some concerns with that because what does that mean the next time that we do that and the next time and the next time? Uh, there is a, a benefit to staying in a process in which people have an expectation of what's going to happen. And, and I think, uh, again, it, in all situations, um, everybody has a tendency to do the least um, uh, that is necessary. Uh, you know, I, I would say things like, you know, if you go to a wedding and you have a, a cash bar versus a, a free bar, um, you're going to drink more alcohol, right? And so, so it's it's really an, an itch, issue in which sometimes we can do things that make it easier for people, but not necessarily help them make the tough decisions that we all have to do in in real life. And uh, that's just the concern that I have. And uh, thank you for addressing addressing that the best of your ability. Thank you, Representative O'Neill. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Howard. Um, in the amendment. It looks to me like there's a change as far as um, where the grants can go and how they can flow through. And I'm wondering, um, it goes to counties. Does it also go to nonprofits and even organizations that are not organized as nonprofits? Representative Howard. Uh, Chair Olson, Representative O'Neill, this would go to existing uh, FHP FHPAP administrators. Uh, so you, it's the folks that are already in our communities administering. Folks, I have that list. It's about 20 entities all across the state. In some of our larger counties, uh, it's the county itself. Mm -hmm. in, in some greater Minnesota folks, uh, it's a community action program mm -hmm. that's been, or a Lutheran Social Services. Let's see if I can find, I'm gonna, I've got the list right here. Let's see if I can find, um, so like Stearns, Benton, Sherburn, Wright counties, Lutheran Social Services of Central Minnesota, as an example. Um, so it's those kinds of entities, and it's about 20, and the coverage is of all 87 counties. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and then can you talk about the audit process that's in existence, or have you changed it at all? Representative Howard. Uh, Chair Olson, Representative O'Neill, there isn't changes to sort of the reporting um, or, or the accountability pieces. There, there are... Uh, fairly stringent requirements in terms of what our FHPAP providers provide to Minnesota Housing, who oversees uh, the, the program. I'd also note that, um, you know, that there are, uh, each of these entities ha has a board um, that's made up of, you know, government officials, 
folks like local law enforcement, school staff, and others uh, to help sort of guide the efforts. Representative O'Neill. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. And then the last question, um, according to the Star Tribune, it said the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency had about 85 million left in reserves for emergency rental assistance. How does this work with that that's already in their reserves? Representative Howard. Chair Olson, Represent, uh, uh, Representative O'Neill, uh, there are, uh, so Minnesota Housing does have uh, a set of resources that came from federal dollars. Uh, this is what they used to administer rent help MN um, and through a few reauthorizations from monies from other states. As I understand, they have about 75 or 85 million. These resources, uh, because they're specifically authorized by Congress, have their own guidelines and requirements that don't necessarily line up with the same parameters of FHPAP. I do think uh, we hope that those resources will be utilized uh, for rental assistance. Um, this bill will allow dollars to flow more, 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 excuse me, more quickly to Minnesotans, um, and there are some differences in terms of eligibility and things that hopefully that they can complement each other and not sort of overlap. I guess I do have one other. Rep Representative O'Neill. Sorry, thank you, Madam Chair. I thought I was at the end and then I just remembered one more quick. Um, so when I was back on the Public Safety Committee, we had reports <clears throat> quite a lot about homelessness. And it was, so I pay attention to those and the last report I've looked at, there might be one for 2023, but I haven't seen it. But for 2022, of the 8,000 that were homeless, 4,000 of them had recently been discharged from DOC, which I found rather alarming. Um, so these are folks that absolutely, and it's difficult for them to find housing. That's no question and it's, it's a known fact. But in what you're doing here, since half of them literally are straight out of the DOC and have criminal histories and probably felonies and other reasons why it's difficult for them to get housing, what are you doing in this to specifically address that? Because again, out of 8,000 that you're going to be trying to give assistance to, half of them are very difficult to place and um, are from the DOC. Representative Howard. Chair Olson, Representative O'Neill, that's a really good question. I actually had a meeting with Commissioner Schnell a couple weeks ago. The, they are actually pursuing some of their own housing specific initiatives based on their work um, with their population that's really exciting outside of this work to sort of target resources specifically for that unique population. I would reference in this program, along with just straight rental assistance or utility assistance, these resources can uh, uh, provide help with housing navigation. And so I know, and sometimes with a uh, population that's reentering, some of it is just finding a home that uh, will, and that can be such a barrier and challenge. And so in this way, uh, having that case management support could be uh, Im important. I'd, I'd like to get back to you if there's specifically w what FHPAP providers are, are doing in interactions, because I think it's a good question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate that conversation back. Mm -hmm. Representative Gomez. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Howard for, Howard, for bringing this forward. I just wanted to to say a few things. Um, you know, uh, my colleague across the aisle talked about the supply crisis, and he is absolutely 100% right. We have a housing supply crisis in our state. We particularly have a crisis of housing supply at the deepest levels of affordability, which the area where there's the most need. And, but unfortunately, it's not that we can only have one crisis at a time. Our housing system, our housing, we think of it as a continuum, as you know, um, in, in housing. There are multiple crises at the same time happening. So there is a, a, a supply crisis that's kind of undergirding everything because we have limited supply of affordable home ownership options for people who are ready to move from living in an apartment to living, um, you know, to being able to buy their own home. We have a supply crisis of market rate rental options. We have a supply crisis, as I said, of those deeply affordable options. And we certainly have a, it's not a supply crisis, but we have a crisis of homelessness, which uh, Representative Howard talked about. So the fact that we need to build more housing doesn't mean that we don't have people in our communities right now, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people across our state who are having really profound trouble affording their rent. And it's not because there's like anything wrong with them. 
It's not because they can't manage their money. It's not because they're like not as good as, as those of us who don't face issues with affording our housing. It's because we have accepted an economy that is not paying people enough to afford their lives. I happen to live in a city where we have a $15 per hour um, uh, ordinance. That means that if you work full time, 2,080 hours is usually how you think of a work year, you make $31,200 before taxes. Also in my city, a two bedroom apartment, the median cost of it is $1,600 to $1,800 a month. If you're making $31,200 a year before taxes, because I don't, I, you know, obviously those, those uh, calculations are different for every household, but even without having that taken off, you're spending 65% of your income just on your rent, not your utilities, not your rental insurance, not any of the extra things that you need, or I mean, they're not extra things, not any of the essential things that also make up your housing, housing price overall. And so we just have to look at that. We have to look at that. We have accepted this economy for working class people. And the, the outcome of us accepting those economic conditions are that we have families who are working full time and cannot afford their lives and cannot afford to keep a, he a, a roof over their kids' heads. And we see those costs in our education system and in our medical system in you know <laughs> emergency department admissions and we see that cost in our in our criminal legal system and so and so the reality is right that we have people in our communities right now who need help and they need us to build more housing long term they do they need our support for like a very healthy investment in housing infrastructure bonds and the other tools that we have to build housing. But they also in this moment need us to act with urgency on the urgent crisis that's that is facing them and their household economies. And so it's, we have to be able to do multiple things and those of us who work in housing and understand the interconnected steps on the housing continuum from homelessness to, deeply af to transitional housing to deeply affordable housing uh, rental housing to market rate rental housing, naturally occurring affordable housing to home ownership. Know that we're going to need to take urgent action all along that continuum if we're if we are to expect to actually like impact the entire system. So thank you, uh, Representative Howard, for bringing this forward and for your leadership on thinking holistically about like all steps on the housing continuum and the folks who need our help all along that continuum. Thank you. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Howard. It's very hard to follow that. That was great. Thank you so much, Chair Gomez. I had a really mundane question, which is doesn't fit really well after what you just said. I also, though, can help perhaps a little bit by adding a piece of information. About, there was a question about people leaving prison, and I believe that DHS has a proposal in its budget to also to impact that area with housing support dollars. So I just wanted to say that as well. Um, my question, my very mundane question, really just has to do with how the, with the language of the bill, Representative Howard, because I'm just not sure if the drafting is very clear, because um, I'm just sitting reading the language and having a little trouble just understanding exactly what it means. And this is really in the portion about where the grants go. and. I heard the answers that were given, so my, my question is more just to the language here. And um, so starting like on line um, 1.16 and 1.17, so um, community-based nonprofit organization without a sponsoring resolution may apply for and receive grants outside the metropolitan area. So maybe this doesn't matter, and if I'm just being too picky or something, that's fine, but I'm not sure if that means the grants are outside or the organization is outside the metropolitan area. So there's a little confusion for me just in that language. And then I have another kind of similar picky little thing about how it's written. And I don't know if these are just more for staff to just uh, address the, just the drafting piece. And we could even take it offline. I just thought since this is gonna go to the floor, it might be best to raise it now if there is a kind of a need to fix something. Representative Howard, do you want to 
respond to that or what? Uh, yeah, Representative Olson, and, and then and then maybe to our nonpartisan, I will say uh, this language was developed in consultation with Minnesota Housing, um, in part to make sure that the resources were accessible for existing grantees, um, which are uh, counties or often in Greater Minnesota, um, nonprofit organizations. But I'll, I'll see if our nonpartisan staff have, have more to add on, on your specific language questions. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with uh, responding to the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Liebling, Justin Cope of the House Research Department. The FHPAP program allows grantee, uh, allows there to be multiple types of grantees to provide services outside the metropolitan counties. Those entities include the counties themselves, uh, conglomerations of the counties, tribes, and nonprofit organizations that re have received a sponsoring resolution from the county or counties in which they operate. The language which you quoted, Representative Liebling, would uh, lift the requirement of needing a sponsoring resolution um, for nonprofit organizations to provide services outside the metropolitan counties. Thank you. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so the other one I had a question about is um, just right there 1.19 and uh, down to 1.21. So um, that whole paragraph. If the agency determines the metropolitan area is in need of additional support to serve households that are homeless or at risk of homelessness, the agency may grant funds to entities other than counties in the metropolitan area, including but not limited to nonprofit organizations. So I wonder if what is intended there is the agency may grant funds to entities other than metropolitan area counties, including but not limited to nonprofit organizations. Again, if I'm being just too picky, that's fine, but I just wanted to flag it in case some change was needed. Thank you, Representative Liebling. Mr. Culp. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Liebling. Uh, within the metropolitan counties, only the counties themselves can receive um, awards of grants to provide FHPAP assistance under the statutory program. This would be allowing the uh, nonprofits and other entities also to provide those services. Anything further, Representative Liebling? So, Madam Chair, so does that, you mean, so within the metropolitan counties, it, other organizations in the metropolitan county area are being allowed to, to do the work as well. Is, is that correct? Mr. Cope. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Liebling, correct. This would be increasing the types of entities that can provide assistance within the metropolitan counties. Representative Liebling. Um, okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, I just, I guess I would just suggest looking at that language and Representative Howard, if you think it's fine, it's fine, but I think it might be rearranged a bit to make that more clear, but I'll stop there. Thank you. To that point. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Representative Howard, that's kind of what I was trying to ask you. And and thank you, Representative Liebling, you're very direct. <laughs> but you had said to me that this money is only going to existing recipients, but what the staff just said is that now it's expanding to who can actually distribute the money. So this is actually a, an underlying change. Was that your intention, Representative Howard? Representative Howard. Gerald, <coughs> the, the intent is to provide it to existing grantees. Um, and so we can, could follow up offline to, to make sure we're clear on, clear on that with the language. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, so the language is different than how you presented it. That's why I asked you that question. And thank you, Representative Liebling, for actually reading it into the record because what you're actually doing, and maybe the recipients might be the same, but the in-between, you're changing. So it's going from the, fi the housing finance agency to some unknown entity in the middle to a recipient at the end, and you're changing the middle. You're allowing anybody even if they're not a nonprofit, because that's what it says, but not limited to nonprofits, in the middle to distribute funds. That's the change. And so I'm not sure if that was your intention because you want the end recipient to be the same as what your testimony was, but the middle is changing. And that's a substantial difference. That's a significant 
difference. You've got the housing agency, that's the same. The end recipient, that's the same. But everybody in the middle, we've completely changed who's eligible to pass through. And so that would be my concern. And I realize you, you have 20 in entities that are currently able to do that, but you've just expanded it in this language. So I'm not sure if that was your intent, but that is the language as written. Representative Howard, do you want to answer it or does Mr. Cope follow up? Representative Howard. I'll just say okay. to Ter Charles, Representative Neal, happy to have a conversation uh, offline to make sure that the language is reflective of the intent. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Lead Garofalo, would you? Okay. <clears throat> I don't see anybody else on the list, so we will end discussion here. Uh, thank you, Representative Howard, and thank you, Mr. Cope. And with that, Representative Howard, would you like to renew your motion that House File 1440, as amended, be re-referred to the General Register? Uh, I would indeed. I would make that motion, and I would encourage members to support it. Uh, it's urgently needed, and look forward to moving forward. Thank you, Representative Howard. Motion in front of us. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. No. no. The motion prevails and House File 1440 as amended has been re-referred to the General Register. And members, next Monday during our normal meeting time, we'll be having the Tribal Sovereignty Day uh, presentation, which the speaker had emailed about over the weekend. So we won't be meeting at that time. There will likely be another meeting perhaps this week or at a different time next week outside of our normal meeting time, being we're going to be losing that committee time and we only meet once a week. So please watch your email for that. And I will keep Lee Garofalo in the loop as we do do go about scheduling that to try to give as much heads up as possible. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, GOP members right after a committee, just over in my office, right over there, just for a very quick meeting. Thank you. And seeing no further items before us, we are adjourned.